Good morning. My name is Nick Perry. I'm one of the residents over at Navy rotating with the Spine Foundation for 10 weeks. So thanks for having me. Uh, this morning we'll be talking about thoracolumbar uh, trauma. All right. So our case to kind of uh, get the discussion going, we have a 27 year old attorney. Uh, he has a psych history and he jumped off a balcony going about 40, 50 uh, feet. Uh, he's intubated in the ICU, but he's responsive. He has multiple lower extremity uh, injuries, including calcaneal fracture, which is kind of classic. Um, he's splinted, which hinders a thorough exam. Uh, however, he's not able to demonstrate any meaningful uh, motor uh, in the L4S1. Uh, he has no rectal tone, no perianal sensation. He has a fully in place. These are his initial x-rays. And one of the things just off the bat, that was a uh, important learning point for me, especially looking at the AP of the spine, is uh, looking at the, um, the pedicles and uh, making sure that they line up. And you can see on this at the L3 level, he has a widened uh, inner particular distance compared to his other levels. You can see uh, the compression of the vertebral body on the lateral. The lateral. As, far as, advanced, as far as advanced, as far as advanced imaging, as as advanced imaging on the L3, you see. Uh, the burst fracture with retropulsion into his canal and on the axial, he has uh, at least 50%, probably greater um, canal compromise. And then on his MRI on the sagittal, he has signal in the posterior ligamentous complex. Um, and then on the axial, you can see how um, squeezed his cauda is. Um, so that's kind of our initial case. Uh, and so getting into anatomy, um, when we talk about thoracolumbar trauma, there's kind of three distinct regions um, that we can break it down into a little bit more. There's the T-spine, uh, which is the L1, sorry, E1 to 10. And then you have the thoracolumbar juncture, T11 to about two. And then the lumbar spine, the lower lumbar spine, which is L3 to L5. Kind of talking about some of the unique characteristics from an anatomic perspective. Uh, the T-spine, you have more coronal uh, orientation of your facets, smaller disc, and obviously you have the rib cage there that provides a lot of support and uh, makes it a more rigid structure. Um, and you have a high rate of uh, neurologic injury with high energy uh, trauma to this region. Uh, as you go a little bit lower, the thoracolumbar juncture, this is important because it's a transition zone from a relatively rigid T-spine to a, a very flexible uh, lower L-spine. Uh, and because of that, you have a tremendous amount of stress uh, at this region. And so you see a fair amount of trauma that manifests itself at this level. And then uh, kind of going further down into uh, lumbar spine, uh, it's more mobile here. Your facets change orientation and they're more sagittal. Uh, you don't have the support of the rib cage, which makes it less rigid, but also that's what gives you a lot of the flexibility. As far as the epidemiology, um, there's about 160,000 spinal injuries in North America per year. Uh, if you look at thoracolumbar, um, the vast majority of these are in that junction area that we were talking about, uh, up to 50%, um, followed by T spine and L spine. Uh, like most trauma, men uh, outweigh women and it's usually a disease of kind of the younger population and then you also have that bimodal distribution as people get older. Mechanisms is typically a high energy um, and so the two typical uh, stories are a motor vehicle collision or a fall from height. A fall from height is the one for our case today that accounts for about 60-70% of the patients that present with these injuries. Uh, and then also when we have these injuries, we have to make sure that we're not missing anything else because there's a high uh, association, high rate of associated injuries, um, and not just orthopedic injuries, but stuff in the chest and the belly. And so we have to make sure that um, we as a medical team are casting a wide net um, and making sure that we're not just focused on the bony osseous tissues and neurologic tissues. Um, as far as uh, initial clinical evaluation, uh, ATLS uh, protocol to uh, get going, make sure uh, we save their life. 
Um, that's kind of what I was getting at in the last one. Uh, the history, it's important to know the mechanism and what neurologic symptoms they have. When we're evaluating them, making sure that uh, we're maintaining log roll precautions, especially uh, when we don't know the extent of the injury. And then as far as examination, um, making sure that we have a thorough neurologic exam, understanding that depending on when we see the patient, it may be limited, uh, or we may not be able to do portions of it that we like, but make sure that we have thorough and accurate documentation that reflects the reality of the patient at the time we saw them. And remember that it can evolve as we see them. There should be uh, special attention to sacral sparing, and that'll help us differentiate between a complete and incomplete uh, spinal cord injury. Um, and also uh, assessing if we think they are in spinal shock or not, and making and that will allow us to ha have that accurate assessment of their neurologic status. From a radiographic perspective, uh, with X-rays, the basic uh, assessment is looking for alignment, rotation, translation, uh, decrease on your vertebral height. Kyphosis is a very important one and making sure that your uh, joints, your facet joints are aligned and there's no uh, dislocation there. Kind of mentioned it on the first slide, but that uh, widened uh, interparticular distance is another one that can give you a big hint. But uh, the punchline is, is that x-rays are not the best way to evaluate the spine, especially in a trauma situation. Um, in 92, Bullock had an article that showed that uh, there's about one, one out of four uh, Compression fractures are misread. Um, so CT or advanced imaging is definitely the way we, that we, especially as spine surgeons, need to evaluate uh, these injuries. Um, that's going to allow us to accurately characterize the fracture morphology, and it also helps us better assess um, the canal and foramen so we can kind of correlate that with uh, neurologic or potential neurologic injury. Obviously, to get a better look at soft tissues, uh, MRI is going to be the heavy hitter here. Things that we look at specifically are the disc uh, for disc injury. Um, the posterior ligamentous complex is very important. Some of the major components of that are looking for the signal in the facet capsule, the ligamentum flavum, and the intraspinous and supraspinous uh, ligaments as well. And that's kind of what the value of the MRI is, and we'll kind of get into that with the TLIC score later. It can also give us clues about uh, the status of their neurologic tissue, the cord, and um, nerve roots as well. And we can look for cord hemorrhage or uh, epidural hematoma that way that may be causing compression. Uh, going into the classification, uh, one thing that you'll know looking through a lot of this uh, the literature is that there's a lot of different types of classification. They're evolving. We've recently had new classifications come out in the last uh, decade or two. Um, and usually when we have a lot of things and it's constantly changing, uh, you know, it makes us think that there are holes in it or it's imperfect. And I think that's uh, one area that we as a, a orthopedic uh, spine community are still striving to perfect. So DENS had the one of the first classifications and conceptually broke it up into three columns, the anterior, middle, and posterior. The anterior is the uh, anterior two-thirds of the vertebral body and the ALL, the middle is the posterior one-third along with the posterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior column is everything posterior to that. So that's your uh, pedicles, lamina, spinous process, and then the posterior ligaments is complex that we discussed earlier. Uh, he also recognized that there's minor types uh, that probably are not structurally significant, such, a, such as spinous process and TP fractures. As we kind of evolved through the 80s, um, McCaff and Ferguson kind of help us uh, develop a better understanding. Um, they initial, they recognized that there's indicators of instability in these, such as progressive neurologic uh, defect or kyphosis greater than 20 degrees, 50% um, height loss, subluxation of your facet, or if you have um, an incomplete deficit with bony fragments in the canal, those are things to make you think that this is an unstable injury. Uh, 
Uh, and then also as we kind of evaluate it, especially on CT, trying to guess what the mechanism is. And that kind of helps us, uh, again, answer the question, is this an unstable injury that needs to be intervened on? These are the kind of seven mechanisms that they describe. AO had the first classification in uh, 84, kind of broke it into three major groups. Vertebral body compression um, is the type A, type B is the anterior posterior with distraction, and then C is um, anterior posterior with rotation. As you can see, it's a very wordy um, and kind of a cumbersome classification system. In 2005, um, the Spinal Trauma Study Group released their uh, TLIX score, um, and this was a good classification system because it strives to help direct uh, whether we should operate or not, and it also helps us think about what approach um, posterior, or sorry, anterior posterior combined we should be using to address these. The basic component of it, there's three major groups. So there's the injury morphology, there's integrity of the posterior ligaments complex, which usually you need to get an MRI to assess unless there's a bony chance that you can obviously see on CT. Um, and then the neurologic status of the patient. And probably one of the big things to point out here uh, is that uh, incomplete injury is rated higher than a complete. Um, and the thought behind that is if they're incomplete, maybe you can get more bang for your buck. You can have better neurologic recovery um, by operating on these. Uh, and then less than four points, uh, they recommend not operating. Uh, greater than four, operate. And then four is kind of indeterminate um, judgment of the surgeon. Uh, and then just to kind of uh, reemphasize this, the integrity of the posterior ligament is complex. Uh, things you're looking for on MRI are uh, signal change in that posterior ligament is complex. You can also assess the facets, especially the axial and the CT, to make sure that the facets look symmetric. There's no diastasis in one or both compared to the different levels or if there's a bony chance fracture. Um, those are going to be kind of your clues. And like I said, it also helps us kind of direct uh, how we should be fixing these. Um, and basically, uh, you kind of go where the money is. If there's anterior neurologic compression, you should have some anterior component. Um, if there's a posterior, uh, if it's only posterior and the posterior ligaments is complex, is disrupted, uh, then you should go posterior. Uh, and then if you have both of those, uh, you can uh, address it with a combined procedure. Uh, and then as far as the reliability of the TLIC score, multiple uh, authors have showed that it's a reliable way to at least characterize and think about these patients. However, you have to use caution as you get further down in the lumbar spine, it's not as reliable there. Uh, and most importantly, uh, does it work? Does it prevent decreased neurologic function? Um, and this 2014 article looked at 65 patients um, and looked at the patients that TLIC recommended non-op and the ones that they recommended op. And importantly, there was no um, worsening of neurologic status in these, uh, according to Asia grade. Uh, 2013, we had our most recent uh, classification by AO spine. Again, this has three major categories, um, compression, distraction, and translation. And kind of talking through it real quick, there's the non-structural, which is the A0. Um, then there are the wedge, uh, Fractures, which is usually just a superior plate with some anterior body wedging. You have a split, which kind of goes superior and inferior in plate. And as far as the burst fracture, the thing that makes it a burst fracture is involvement of that posterior wall. Um, and you can have an incomplete or complete. And that is whether you have just a superior or you have two in plates involved. Um, and then as we get into the distraction, uh, <laughs> We have disruption of <clears throat> engine band and hyperextension. And then last, there's the uh, translation and rotation injuries. There's different neurologic uh, modifiers on this that are listed there. And there's also the M1 and M2, which are kind of, uh, especially the M2 is a unique contribution of this classification system. So how do we treat these injuries? Um, 
the main goal of surgery is to decrease. So as we kind of weave through this, we look for uh, what is stable, what's not stable, what is potentially going to cause uh, deteriorating neurologic function on how can we prevent deformity, so increased kyphosis. Um, so typically the stable fractures are going to be um, your compression fractures and burst fractures, um, and those can be treated non-operatively, and we can talk about brace versus not brace uh, as well. Um, and then the surgery for these fractures, the goal is going to be to decrease the kyphosis, um, to decrease pain, um, and get these people out um, of the hospital faster and onto their um, recovery process. Um, and then if you, there's various studies. Uh, Wood had a really good article kind of really addressing, hey, should we be um, operating on burst fractures? Um, and in that body of literature, even though uh, it's based off of surgeries that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, demonstrated that uh, you don't have any difference in pain um, or the patient reported outcomes, and you just have an increased wow. complication. And so that kind of calls into question if we should be operating on stable burst fractures. Uh, however, one of the criticisms <coughs> of that is that that kind of old antiquated technique and before a lot of the minimally invasive uh, pedicle screw systems came out. So that's something to think about when we're interpreting this literature. As far as non-operative manage or as far as bracing, um, there's a lot of uh, literature that suggests that it probably doesn't make a difference. Um, and it, uh, as far as patient reported outcomes, it probably doesn't make a difference as far as uh, kyphosis and deformity in these, um, uh, these fractures. For operative management, um, we're kind of looking at our unstable fractures, and this is, this is unstable burst fracture, our flexion distraction, and fracture dislocation injuries. Uh, kind of hit on it, but the reason why we operate on these are to stabilize the spine, decrease deformity, get these patients um, along their rehab um, protocol faster. Um, however, it has not been shown to make any difference in the long-term neurologic uh, outcome of these patients. So that's not a reason why we do surgery um, reliably. So our indications are incomplete or progressive neurologic deficit, cord compression, fracture dislocation, kyphosis greater than 30 degrees, um, and then other injuries in a polytrauma population. As far as timing for surgery, um, La Rosa looked at early and late, and in the early less than 24, had almost 50% of the complete uh, spinal cord injuries and 90% of the incomplete show some uh, improvement. And this is uh, compared to the late, which only had about 10% in the complete and 60% in the incomplete. So th this kind of uh, indicates that we should be getting to these as soon as uh, we can and they're medically cleared. Uh, it also decreases their hospital stay, gets them out of the ICU faster and gets them off the vent, vent faster. Uh, however, the less than 12 versus less than 24 uh, doesn't seem to make much of a difference and how much cord damage they have on MRI probably is the best predictor. As far as how we can go and address these, um, so like I mentioned, there's a you can do posterior, you can do anterior, you can do combined um, for these. So for a posterior short segment uh, fixation, you're mostly relying on uh, ligamentous taxis and postural change to affect your decompression. Um, there's a interesting study from the 90s that show that just with the ligamentous taxis, you can decrease the canal compromise from about 50 to 20%. Um, so, but you still have some canal compromise. Um, the advantages of this is it is a familiar surgical approach to most spine surgeons. Uh, it's relatively simple. Um, the disadvantages, however, are you can have a progressive kyphosis, failure of your instrumentation, and pseudoarthrosis, and an incomplete decompression. Uh, uh, things that you can do to make your posterior construct better. You can uh, add bone grafting. You can think about if you should put cement in the body or your screws uh, 
to kind of supplement that fixation. Uh, and then you can also instrument the fractured level, um, which is the intermediate screws, and that kind of helps increase the stiffness of your construct. Uh, and then McCormick attempted to try to find the factors that help us predict what constructs and what fracture patterns are going to fail with just a posterior only. Um, however, recently it's shown that uh, his system isn't as reliable as we thought in the early 2000s. Uh, going on to anterior, the main uh, indication for having an anterior uh, portion of your construct is if there's cord compression coming from retropulsed um, bony fragments on the anterior part of the canal, so you can't get to it most of the time from the posterior. Uh, it does allow you to get better sagittal alignment on these. And then finally, you can do uh, combined, and usually you're going to do this for uh, greater than 40 degrees of kyphosis, um, significant uh, canal compromise, especially from a, a anterior retral pulse fragment. Uh, and then the advantage is you kind of get the best of both worlds, better sagittal alignment, uh, thorough uh, decompression anteriorly, and then you also stabilize your tension band posteriorly. Obviously, it's a bigger surgery, um, and there's more surgical uh, morbidity from that. Um, in 2006, Pear showed that we can have uh, good results from this, no implants failure, and people get better from a neurologic status. Um, and then uh, Ben also kind of looked at the combined versus uh, posterior only, showed no difference um, in the patient reported outcomes, however, less implant failures in the combined versus uh, the posterior only. Uh, so kind of going back to our patient, um, if you calculate his TLIC score, uh, he was eight, um, he had uh, anterior compression from that retropulsed uh, fragment. He also had a failure of his uh, posterior tension band. And so that kind of suggests that we should do a combined anterior and posterior. And so the surgery that he had was he had a L3 um, corpectomy. He had anterior cage fusion, L2 to four, and then posterior uh, one to five. And here's his construct, it's the Pew um, instrumentation. So in conclusion, um, uh, thoracolumbar trauma is relatively common in the spine world. It's usually high energy. There's a high rate of neurologic injury, especially in the thoracic spine for those anatomical reasons we talked about. Um, within this, that junction, that transition zone is the most susceptible uh, as you go from a stiff uh, to a relatively flexible area. So uh, really focuses the force there. Uh, we're still trying to find the best classification system. Uh, and then uh, the main surgical indications, three column injuries, progressive neurologic deficit, uh, kyphosis greater than 30 uh, degrees and canal compromise. Uh, and then you have several surgical options, posterior, anterior, combined. Um, that's what I have. Thank you for your attention. Comments, questions, concerns? Nice job, Nick. Thank you. What were your uh, main learning points going through? So uh, I have, um, you know, uh, for me going through this, uh, I, I've been exposed to TLIC multiple times through residency, but really, as I, especially as I moved from being a junior resident to a senior resident, really assessing, well, here's the injury. How is that? how's that gonna dictate my construct? What do I need to do to this guy mechanically to stabilize him? So I think the most interesting thing I got from my reading for this is really that last portion delving into, uh, you know, the advantages, disadvantages of anterior, posterior, posterior only. And um, I also thought it was really interesting kind of looking at the older literature, which is specifically that Wood article from JBJS, where they're saying, hey, we shouldn't operate on these burst fractures. 
and the literature and the paper looks good. Um, but when you step back from it and you think, hey, these surgeries were done in the 90s, um, they do techniques that we don't do anymore and we have new ones. So we need to continually reassess ourselves. And maybe there's an indication uh, in some of these patients to do um, posterior fixation, don't do a fusion, uh, leave that in there for them to heal and you can take it out in a year or two. Um, so those are the kind of take home points or interesting things I feel like I learned from doing this um, talk. Hey, good, good points. I don't think, to your point, I, I, you know, I don't think that um, um, to, to Wood's paper, um, they, we did probably as good a job at differentiating who should be operated on. I mean, that, that paper was a stable first fracture group of patients. So it's questionable whether they all needed to have surgery based on the T-Lex classification anyway, right? Yeah. So it, 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 you have to you have to get through the first question, um, which is should they be operated on? And that you know there's always some gray with Telix fours or thereabouts. Um, after that, as, as you said, you, then you got to decide how do I marry um, this patient to the best outcome and relatively reasonable health economics and lower risk. That's not always as easy, especially with evolving technology. But um, I think one of the other things to always keep in mind with these two is is um, not just the morbidity of the approach, but the morbidity of the um, of the area that you have to stabilize. Um, you know, if you're if you're having to do, let's say a a five level fusion or a four or five level fusion. In the in the mid or lower lumbar spine, that's a very different morbidity for the patient than doing it in the lower thoracic spine, where you need to tie up a little bit of the upper lumbar spine motion. Um, so keep an eye on on how constrained you are for the patient in their long term function as you're prescribing the the approach and the extent of fixation. In addition to the biomechanical concerns and uh, the bone integrity, all those other factors that you have to consider as you as you decide not that you should be operating but how to operate got it thank you it's got to be mundus well thanks nick <laughs> but uh, what's that i said that had to be you wrestling around <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh. I have a quick question. You know, I don't take call over at Memorial, but for the, for the guys that do, do you have a lot of experience of just like doing perk screws for stabilization, almost like an internal brace, and then taking them out, particularly on young folks, um, once you feel like they're stable? Yeah, we used to do that. Um, yeah, I, I do it quite often, uh, um, Hanny, but, um, you know, the, I can, I mean, especially the younger folks, you know, I think it's probably worthwhile to do it that way. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but I usually still use Telix, and you know, the things you got to just be, you know, even from the McCormick classification. One of the one of the one of the things you take away from that is just the amount of comminution that's present, you know, and then you know the Telix also doesn't entirely take into account um, mechanism, which is like a high energy, you know, motor vehicle collision versus a fall versus you know getting a direct blow to the back or something like that, you know the. The, the the mechanisms do, you know, to a certain degree dictate how unstable you even feel a fracture is. So so for those, you know, because like sure. a lot of young people will be neurologically intact with, with their injuries. and But if they have a significant kyphotic deformity or, um, uh, you know, intractable pain or, you know, even embracing that, even with bracing that they're failing, then we'll, we'll perk them. But I'd say in general, pretty conservative over there, at least Ramin and I are. Uh, with regards to how um, how quickly we'll jump to the perk screw thing, so we're probably still a little bit more on the 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 Kirkham Wood side of things rather than on the aggressively perk side of things. Got it. Bracing works is the bottom line, and the thoracic lumbar spine, where we get, usually get injuries, is fairly tolerant of you know a reasonable amount of deformity, you know, and, and I'm I'm not. You know, I wish we had some more clarity. I think some higher volume trauma centers 
be great if they came out with, you know, some prospective data on, you know, op versus non-op with, 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 the, with these more MIS techniques. Awesome. Well, it's uh, just been after seven. Good job, Nick. Appreciate you for putting that together. I thought it was very, uh, very well done, and I'm glad it was, uh, you know, beneficial to you in, in your education as well, especially as you're going into these uh, last couple of years of your of your residency. So, um, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Good job, bud.